In 2040, my oldest son will be the age that I am today. But I believe that the world in 2040 will be quite different from the world we live in today. In exactly what way will depend on decisions that we'll have to make today and the next decade by my generation and by his generation. Huge global population growth, hundreds of millions of people working their way out of poverty who want better lives, more food, better food, more energy for heating their homes, cooling their homes, for productive use at their workplace. There are some big issues developing globally that will change the world, and energy is vital for many of them. Energy provides welfare for people. But energy and the energy systems as we know them as well affect the climate in a detrimental way, and we know this. And that again affects the safety and the security of our lives and of human society. I want my, my three sons and my grandchildren in 2040 and in 2050 to have welfare, but also safety and security. The issues that we're discussing when it comes to a low carbon world and the transition to such affects me, it's personal and it's relevant. It's also relevant because this is my job in Statoil. Now, I've been asked today to talk about the, the role that we believe in Statoil that natural gas can play in transforming our societies to this low-carbon society, and also, as I will come back to, to be part of that long-term energy mix. But before I do that, I want to also share with you, of course, that for Statoil, the climate agenda affects us in many other ways. And I would just like to say that for those of you who would like to discuss oil production or oil sands or electrification of offshore platforms in Norway, please find me on Twitter and I will be happy to engage in those questions. I would love to learn your views and I will try to explain Stotter's views and Stotter's reasoning and strategic choices going into the future. But for today, we'll talk about gas, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you a story about gas, natural gas, uh, which I will divide into three parts. And it's a love story, a love story of three parts. The first part of that love story is about a breakup. It's about leaving coal and switching to gas. And I will get back to why that is a low-hanging fruit, which is really important to achieve, and how we will do that. Then the next phase is about finding a new lover. It is the about the relationship between natural gas and renewables, a relationship very different from any other. And I'll talk more about that. And then at the end, I will tell you about how natural gas will live hap happily ever after in a partnership with new emerging technologies that we're working on today, but where we will need decades in order to decarbonize gas at the end and make it part of the long-term energy mix into maybe you know, decades beyond 2040 and 2050. But let's start with the story about the breakup. Natural gas, switch from coal to natural gas. We believe that if we switch from coal to natural gas, and this is not just us, we will cut emissions immediately by 50% compared to modern coal power plants, and 70% compared to the old coal power plants, which of many are working today. And this is immediately. And we don't need any technology development to do that, because the te technology is mature. We don't need subsidies from public constrained budgets, because the price is competitive. And we believe there is abundance of gas to do so. In Europe, only one third of the power plants for the next decade will need to be reinvested in. And we believe natural gas should be the obvious choice. And indeed, we think that will happen as well. How quickly it will happen will depend on the price of gas, the price of coal, and also, and even more importantly, the cost of polluting, the cost of emitting CO2 or climate gases. So price on pollution is an extremely important tool, and it's a political tool in this context, which Stotter supports that we should have globally. And we, it must be at a level which will actually support such, such a switch. So in Europe, we have this. The price should be increased. 
And we see, and we're quite positive to this actually happening in many parts of the world. We see it happening in Australia. They decided to, in, to have a, a price on pollution, which makes this investment profitable to change from coal to gas. We see it happening in California. China are going to have a cost on climate gases from 2015. Kazakhstan, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, South Korea, New Zealand. It's happening. And we hope we will see countries, important countries like the US, Canada, Russia, also do this in the future. When we talk about the switch from coal to natural gas, we very often enter into debate about security of supply. And this is understandable. Will this switch make us more dependent on certain suppliers of gas? For instance, Russia into Europe. Security of supply of energy is very important. And Stotol knows this. We supply the equivalent of 60 million Europeans every day with gas from the Norwegian shelf. Not doing that is not an option. They are dependent on that gas into their homes every day in terms of heating their houses, boiling their tea, and, and have electricity at their workplace. So security of supply is important. That's why the revolution in shale gas has become a very important part of why this is a viable option. Producing sh gas from shale has come about as a possibility because we have, as an industry, been able to combine technologies to take down the cost of developing that, that natural resource. And in the US now, we believe that, or we believe as an industry, that they will be independent on gas for the next century, 100 years of gas supply in the US. And in China, we believe that there is as much abundance of, of shale gas, which would, which would be an enormous opportunity to shift China from coal, of which they are today 80% dependent upon in their power production, to gas. And in Europe as well, we believe there is shale gas. It's much harder to develop shale gas in Europe. It's highly popular populated areas, and we need to drill thousands of wells to develop a shale gas field. So doing that needs to be done in close cooperation between government and industry, but we are hopeful that that will be able to, done, to be done. Now that leads me into the second phase, or the second part of our love story, namely the renewables. Now, Gas is abundant, it's technology mature, it's, um, it will cut emissions, but it, that's not enough. We need to do more. And renewables will have to play a very important part in the energy mix going forward. And indeed, a lot has happened for the past decade. And we see you know, the development and the investments and the scaling within solar and wind power, for instance, has been amazing. And as many of you know, Stotol is also part of that investment. We have as a company uh, thought through all the technologies within renewables and landed on the, that technology where we believe that we can leverage our competence within maritime operations, offshore operations through decades, and hence we are investing in offshore wind. That is where Stotol may bring competence to the table, drive costs down, and increase competition and take uh, an important position on the global market. So we want to do offshore wind. That's why we're investing in a big, uh, an opening in these days, a big windmill park offshore UK called Sheringham Shoal. And we're also looking into making a huge investment uh, together with, amongst others, Stadkraft on Dogger Bank. And we are also, uh, and we're very proud of that, we've, we've developed for the past and had in place for the past year and a half a floating windmill pilot called High Wind, which has actually demonstrated fantastic results, far beyond what we had expected, a production efficiency of 50%, which is actually more than we see on most windmills onshore. So the High Wind project is something we will take further and we have great hopes for. Now, as most of you know, but I think a lot of people actually underestimate, the problem with renewables is intermittency. You cannot trust the electricity coming from a solar or a windmill power station. It is intermittent. It is only there when the sun shines and the wind blows. And we are today not able 
to store that electricity. So on a windy night, where, where, this, where, you know, where we don't use much electricity, that electricity, that wind, that power is wasted. Or you know, on a solar, solar factory, solar power plant, there is nothing coming out at night. So you cannot depend on renewable power plants. You need a base load energy source to go with it. And this is, of course, where natural gas comes into the love story. And it's important because it happens very quickly. You need a base load which can scale up and scale down within minutes, within half hours. Coal cannot do that. Nuclear cannot do that. Natural gas can. And this means that for utility, for our customers, utilities uh, companies, the more natural gas they have as a base load in their energy system, the more renewables they can take on into the grid. And that's why natural gas, as hydropower as well, is in a very important partner in order for all of us to scale up and use renewables in our energy systems. So that's the second phase of our love story. And that brings me on to my last phase, namely the long, happy live, living happily ever after partnership with new technologies. We believe that gas, gas will become un, less and less competitive going forward. The cost of pollution, as I said, will increase. Hence gas, who does emit CO2 emissions and climate gases, will become less competitive. So today, Stadtol is working on how do we decarbonize gas in 2040, 2030, 2040, 2050, in order for gas, which is a fantastic resource, to become part of the long-term energy mix. And carbon capture and storage is obviously one of those alternative te technologies that we're working on. And as many of you know, Stotoil is a world-leading company within carbon capture and storage. We've been ca capturing and storing CO2 on the Schleipner platform for 15 years. And we do it also in the Arctic, on Snövit. Now, that is quite easy, because it's capturing CO2 coming from the well stream in, quite, in concentrated and small volumes. What we need to develop is technology to capture CO2 from, from the gas power plants, from the exhaust. Quite a different technology, quite a different task. And we're working on that together with the Norwegian government at Mongsta. We're actually opening our test facility with two huge pilot technologies being tested on the 7th of May this year. And then we are working to present for the government a possibility to invest in a full-scale uh, CCS project on Mongsta in 2014, the so-called moon landing project. I want us to consider and, and, and think about this as very immature technology. It's challenging, it's expensive. And I think, you know, they will be clumsy and big and strange in the beginning. It's like the mobile phone that my father had in the 80s, you know, basically a suitcase. And look what we have today, 30 years later. This is what we're gonna see with some of these technologies. We will see lean and mean and commercial CCS technologies 20, 30, 40 years from now. But we have to start working on them, and that's what we're doing today. And we have to accept that development. So summarizing, gas is fantastic. It's available. It needs no new technology at the moment. It will cut emissions dramatically. But it will take technology development. That's where we need uh, research uh, and technology development from all of you and it needs smart policies. So I hope many of you also find these challenges personal and that you will join us in the quest. Thank you for your attention.